This episode of Warp 5 is brought to you by Audible.com, offering more than 180,000 titles for smartphone, tablet, and desktop. To get a free audiobook of your choice and help Trek FM at the same time, visit audibletrial.com slash trekfm. And also by Enterprise in Space, an international program of the nonprofit National Space Society. Find out how you can help science and education and become a virtual crew member aboard the NSS Enterprise Orbiter by visiting enterpriseinspace.org. And if you want to join in on the conversation and share your thoughts on this episode or any other, please join the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type Babel, that's B-A-B-E-L, into the Facebook search field. We look forward to seeing you there. This is David A. Goodman, writer and consulting producer for Star Trek Enterprise, and you're listening to Warp 5 on Trek FM. permission to get underway. Let's go. Welcome, boomers, to another episode of Warp 5. I'm your estranged host, back from a secret mission in parts unknown, deep in Breen territory, and, uh, you know, hanging out with the Orion Syndicate and whatnot, but I- I'm back, I've put the bad guys in jail, and I'm-, I'm here to talk some more Star Trek Enterprise with my good friend Patrick. How are you doing, Patrick? I'm doing good, I'm doing good. It's good, uh, for once we're not meeting in a dark corner somewhere of an alleyway, but... Yes, excellent. Those dark corners and those dark alleyways, uh, there nothing good can come out of those corners and alleyways. That's what I think. So Brandy's not here today because Brandy is away on a work conference, but we do have a very special guest joining us today. And in case you weren't able to tell based on our topic, based on our little hints at the beginning, we're going to be talking about Section 31. And I couldn't think of any better guest to join us to discuss this nefarious corporation within Starfleet that other than the man who literally wrote the book, not just one book, but two books on Section 31, David Mack. How are you doing, David? Pretty good. Glad to be here. Excellent. Thank you so very much for joining us. Um, we're just going to jump right into our discussion right now. So I do have a few uh, a few plot points, but we're going to kind of just make it a general discussion talking about uh, talking about Section 31 itself. But you know, Section 31 was introduced in Season 6 of Deep Space Nine, and it, it seems to be a really divisive aspect of Star Trek. People seem to either really like Section 31 and the idea of Section 31, or they kind of seem to really not like it and not think that it's very Federation or Starfleet. Now, I know how I feel about Section 31, and I think I know how David feels about it, but David, gen- in general, what do you feel about having Starfleet, having this nefarious organization within their ranks that are working under the radar in these these questionable ways? I think the first thing you need to remember is that Section 31 is not supposed to be an officially sanctioned arm of Starfleet. They are supposed to be a rogue organization, one that is outside of the normal chain of command, one that does not have any legal or government oversight. And this is the root of why the characters on Deep Space Nine, Julian Bashir, Captain Sisko, object to not only the actions of Section 31, but the very existence of Section 31. Its very existence is an affront to what the Federation says it stands for and to what Starfleet uh, is supposed to be as an organization. So that's the first thing you need to keep in mind, is that they are not supposed to be uh, a sanctioned organization or subunit of Starfleet or Starfleet intelligence. They are something else. They are non-governmental, they are non-military, yet they have access to people within those. They are essentially an illegal, independent, covert operations uh, intelligence service is really what they are. And the fact that they've obviously been around for a very long time, uh, centuries probably by the point where we are exposed to them in the 24th century on DS9, they've had time to infiltrate many organizations, to build networks of intelligence, uh, networks of material and financial support, uh, to 
gather intelligence to probably uh, put foreign operatives in play within the uh, rivals of the Federation. So this is an organization that I think we have to understand is meant to stand as a contrast. It's sort of like looking into a, a black mirror of Starfleet. Uh, and you're supposed to look at this and say, that's not right. But their argument is we need to exist to do the things that the good guys of the Federation and of Starfleet will not let themselves do. And they claim that without them, the sort of utopian society of the Federation could not survive against less scrupulous, more ruthless opponents, and that therefore they have taken this burden upon themselves to ensure that the Federation survives. In many ways, they remind me of uh, the character who plays the bad guy in the movie Serenity, who has to explain to Nathan Fillion's character, to Mal, uh, I'm a monster trying to create a world in which I will have no place. That's what Section 31, in many respects, seems like they're trying to do. They are the monsters trying to create a world in which they will not be necessary anymore. But that does not necessarily either legally or morally excuse what they do. On the other hand, there is an argument to be made that, well, could the Federation have survived and prospered as well as it has without their intervention? And the problem is that's a very difficult, if not impossible, question to answer. It requires, you know, so many variables, the revisionist concept of history that, to unravel what they did from what happened and to say, well, what would have happened had they not been there? Well, there's really no way to know. In that respect, their argument is tautological and self-fulfilling. Mm -hmm. And therefore, in my opinion, ultimately unpersuasive. Right. Now, do you remember your initial reaction to Section 31 when seeing them on Deep Space Nine the first time? I remember thinking it was kind of cool because uh, at that point, uh, I was big into thrillers, Tom Clancy stuff. Uh, and I remember thinking, this is interesting. This is not Starfleet intelligence. These are the, uh, you know, sort of the, the dirty tricks people, you know, the, the black ops, the, the guys who uh, are disavowed. They're like Mission Impossible, but they're more violent. Uh, and I remember thinking at first that that was cool, but then sort of seeing, okay, once our heroes started laying out the argument for what is morally wrong with this organization's very existence – and how it is an offense to everything that these guys have sworn an oath to uphold, I had to reconsider my opinion of such organizations, not only within the Star Trek universe, but within the real world, which I think was part of the point. Uh, part of the argument, I think, of having Section 31 there was, and this is part of something that DS9 did throughout its run, was to question the concept of utopia. It's very easy to be a saint in utopia, but what happens when your back gets put to the wall and the food starts to run out and you're under fire? How many moral compromises can you make before you are no longer fighting for the principles you claim to uphold? And I think that that was part of why Section 31 was brought to the fore during this time of war when the Federation is starting to lose and it looks very likely that the Federation could lose this war and go down badly. And that's when the Black Ops organization steps in to try and, uh, you know, tip the scales back in the Federation's favor. Uh, and it's a very interesting argument. Mm -hmm. Patrick, do you remember your initial uh, impressions of Section 31 when you first watched Deep Space Nine? I, I actually enjoyed the fact that they're, of their existence from the very start. Uh, I still do to this day. I remember seeing it and thinking to myself that, yes, they do need to exist in order for all this to exist. Now, I'm, I could be totally wrong. And, that, yes, the show was actually asking that question. But I do believe on some level that if the other side's doing it, you have to do it too, even if it is morally uh, reprehensible to you. Mm -hmm. um, not everyone's built to do those missions, but... There are people who are built to do those missions, and maybe they don't uphold the moral standards of what you're fighting for, but that's why you have them do it and not you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, I don't think it's a case of, like, they have it, so we have to have it, because, you know, they make the comparison of the Tal Shiar and the Obsidian Order, and we see in Enterprise that Section 31 has been around for a while uh, by the time we get to Season 4 of Enterprise, and we don't really know much about the Romulans at this time, right? So we haven't had the Romulan War yet. The only encounters that we've had on screen with the Romulans uh, were in Minefield, 
um, and then off screen with the Vulcan arc. You know, so, uh, you know, we haven't really had a lot of interaction with the Romulans at that time. So it's just, it's something that the Federation had before it realized there was other aliens out there that had this kind of organization. And, you know, see, the, the interesting thing about television writing is the writer writes the story that they want to tell. They're like, okay, I have this story I want to tell, and it goes this way. And so while we have these values that we want the Federation to uphold to, you know, there's there's many examples where our, our own heroes and our own crew are doing reprehensible things. I mean, I watched today um, the Affliction and Divergence two-parter, and in this episode, you know, Phlox contaminated the Klingon ship with this plague. You know, like, that's almost a Section 31 reprehensible act that he undertook on his own. And, I mean, Kira did the same thing in um, uh, Babel in Season 1 of Deep Space Nine when she beams that guy aboard, not knowing whether he knows anything about the cure or not, and infects him. You know, these th- and then at the end of the episode, they do everything turns out okay because that's the story that we want to tell. But these are reprehensible acts that our main characters have done, and those are just two examples. What do you think about something like that, David? Again, you're fixating on the tactics and what you're missing is the organizational component, which is what makes Section 31 different. What's different about this uh, here is that you're citing actions by Starfleet officers. If somebody really wanted to bring them up on charges, subject them to a court martial, or in the case of Kira, maybe a government inquest before the Council of Ministers or whoever is the reigning authority on Bajor, that could happen. They could be brought up on charges. You could face a court-martial. The problem with Section 31 is it is not an official organization. It is extra-legal. It does not answer to any authority. It does not answer to any oversight. Officially, it doesn't exist. That Again, and this is a key difference between Section 31 and the Tal Shiar and the Obsidian Order. The Tal Shiar and the Obsidian Order are both the official state-sanctioned foreign intelligence services of their governments, and they are supposed to be answerable to their governments. Somebody, the head of state, the commander-in-chief, somebody has operational control and authority over those organizations and ultimately has to answer for what those organizations do. Section 31 does not have that. It is, in effect, a criminal organization that claims to be acting on the behalf of the Federation and has co-opted many Starfleet assets for its use, probably because it it originated within Starfleet or within some Federation branch of the government. But it is not a legally recognized or sanctioned operating entity of the Federation. The Federation has the Federation Security Agency for Internal Civilian Intelligence and Counterintelligence, and it has Starfleet Intelligence for Military Intelligence and Foreign Intelligence Operations. It doesn't need Section 31, at least not legally. The argument that, well, the other side's got their intelligence services, we need to have ours. We do have ours. Section 31 isn't it. Ours are the FSA and Starfleet Intelligence. Section 31 is something that abrogated power unto itself, arrogated that power unto itself to take action both within the Federation on a domestic level and outside the Federation, acting as a foreign intelligence operative without any official sanction, without any oversight, and without any legal culpability. And that is the big difference here. That is the problem. It's not the tactics. It's not the actions. It's the absence of oversight. It is the absence of accountability. Okay, so I have to admit that it's 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 probably my na- naivete, naivete, naivety. Naive, oh, naivete. Yeah, thank you. It's it's probably my naivete, but I never realized that they were not beholden to the government of Starfleet. It's explicitly <laughs> said in the episodes in Deep Space Nine. Is it? I never. Re- I, I was okay. I mean, See, it I'm is. not saying you're wrong. I'm just saying I didn't. Re- I didn't think of it that way. Like. So as I'm watching them, I'm not thinking of them as someone who has... I thought of them more of as like a Delta squad who, quote-unquote, does not exist. But they're still beholden to the U.S. government. You know what I mean? Right. So I looked at it that way. And so I understand your problems with it now being defined exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. Because you're not saying we don't need spies and people to do the dirty things. You're just saying they're not the ones that should be doing it. Right. Mm -hmm. Mm Mm-hmm. 
Yeah, see, like, I've always interpreted, and I guess, you know, we have this thing on Trek FM where we talk about a headcanon and stuff because, you know, we're given piece of information on there, and I've always interpreted it, especially because of the way that they word it, you know, in um, the first episode that we get them in in season six, which is I'm drawing a blank on the title of right now, um, where Cisco says, look, Starfleet says that officially they don't exist. Right. But they'll investigate it. You know, I'm paraphrasing here. I don't have the exact words in front of me right now. But um, the way that I've always read that is like they are an official organization. They just don't acknowledge them publicly because they are written into the charter. There is a like one line that that's somewhere in the charter that says that they have this clause and therefore that's that's how they were made. They are funded by Starfleet because they have to have funding from somewhere. Right, in my opinion. So they, they stand up and when when Starfleet stands up and says they don't exist, but when they sit down, they know that they do exist and they do acknowledge them. That's just how my personal interpretation of it has been. Yeah, so that that's pretty much how I interpreted it mm-hmm. as well. That like like I said, like the like the Deltas or, or the even CIA you know, they don't exist. Mm-hmm. Um if you get caught you're on your own, we don't know who you are type thing. But I never took them as not ex- non existent and answering to no one. So I guess that's why, and like Brandon, you said, you know, the whole, if they have them, we need them, but they show up before we had the Romulan War. Yeah, but in my first initial watch, it was the first time I saw them was Deep Space Nine, so I wasn't thinking of mm-hmm. having them before that. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, that's the interesting thing about it in Deep Space. Like, it's, they, they've changed and whatnot, and I guess that kind of leads to my next question on them, is that... You know, when we watch Deep Space Nine and we watch it through, like, I love I love Section 31. They're one of my favorite aspects of Star Trek. I think they're really interesting. But a lot of people have, have made the complaint about Section 31 that they may be overutilized and overused in Star Trek now. Because when we get them in Deep Space Nine, the way that they're spoken of is this is basically the first time anybody's really heard of them publicly. You know, and then mm-hmm. so we start we start seeing them on D Space Nine. We see them I think it's three times on D Space Nine that they're brought up. And after D Space Nine, then we get them on Enterprise. And after Enterprise, we get them in Into Darkness. And then after Into Darkness, now we have them on Star Trek Discovery as well. Mm-hmm. So they're starting to crop up a little bit more. And we've seen them a lot in the fiction, which um you know, you get a lot of novels and whatnot that bring these guys up. They were heavily involved in uh in the, the fall series. And events afterwards, after that, with Bashir and the Breen and lots of really great stuff. Um, but is this something that was overutilized on screen? Is it something that they went back to t- too many times? What do you think, David? I think part of the problem is that, A, they fixated upon it as this cool element uh, with the black uniforms and the, the mystery and the sort of Mission Impossible quality to it. And I think the problem was that after the people who were running DS9, people like Iris Stephen Bear, Robert Ewitt Wolf, Ron Moore, uh, once these guys moved on, the folks who inherited uh, the mantle of Star Trek on television, first on Enterprise and then later the J.J. Abrams team with the films and now uh, Alex Kurtzman and his team at Secret Hideout, they fixate on how cool the superficial aspects of Section 31 are but they fail to comprehend the moral ambiguity and the moral problems that Section 31 was meant to represent. The very existence of Section 31 and the reason it came up at when it did on DS9 was supposed to be about the fact of the uh, morals and the, you know, the very sort of moral fabric of the Federation being tested by the threat of potentially losing a major war. And that was what brought Section 31 sort of out of the shadows as far as they were willing to go to influence the outcome of the war. And that was what put them into contact with our characters on DS9. Had there not been such a crisis, I think we're meant to believe that Section 31 would have stayed in the shadows and not done anything, wouldn't have popped its head up at all. And we probably still would have never heard of it. The problem was is that then you have producers who go, well, that's a really cool element. Why don't we bring that in and show, you know, show it on our show? So they start doing it on Enterprise, and they don't realize, well, there's really no reason for it to be here. It doesn't need to be part of their story, but they don't care. They see the superficial element. So they try and sort of show the, uh, the origin, the genesis. How does it come about? What is it in reaction to? And I'm like, all right. So I can sort of see the, the impetus there. The problem is by the time you get to uh, Into Darkness, these guys are working in a parallel universe, not our universe, not the prime universe. 
they are taking a radically different approach where Section 31 has its own ships that are considered part of the fleet. They're building in a massive shipyard within the solar system, uh, like over by Jupiter. They are, they've got massive facilities within the cities. They're pretty much a known entity. And at that point, it's like, okay, this is way enough far away from where Section 31 started on DS9. This is someone who saw the surface level tropes and didn't understand what they meant or what they were being used for. But in a way you go, okay, but that's an alternate universe. In Section 31, there maybe was a more official part of the construct. Here's the problem. The same people or some of the same people who were working on Into Darkness eventually brought that sensibility with them to discovery. Now that notion from an alternate universe has now come back and informed how Section 31 is depicted on a show that's supposed to be set in the prime continuity. And now we have a mismatch. The black com badges, the whole deleted scene shown at uh, Comic-Con, that whole thing with Section 31 operating openly within Starfleet, welcome to Section 31 with the little com badges. These guys didn't have their own com badges. They didn't wear Starfleet uniforms. They didn't operate openly on Starfleet ships. How can you maintain a secret organization if you're operating out in the open where everybody can see you? It contradicted absolutely everything we had been told about Section 31 up to that time. And I, so I think at that point, the problem was is that people wanted a cool spy thing. They latched on to Section 31 because it was high profile and had you know sort of that sheen of coolness about it because of the black uniforms. And it never occurred to them they could just use Starfleet intelligence, that they didn't need Section 31 to be that entity, that they could have created a new entity. But they had Section 31. I don't think that they understood what it was really supposed to represent within the Star Trek universe. And as a result, I think it, had, uh, it has evolved in its on-screen presence into something that it was not meant to be when it was incepted. Mm -hmm. See, I find the lot, that a lot of this stuff happens when you, when you do go to the well a lot and bring up these characters. Like my friend Zach, who's on Standard Orbit, our original series Star Trek podcast here on the network, him and I, uh, he and I, we've, we've created a new podcast called Franchise Fatigue. It's completely separate from Trek FM. But what it is, is we look at franchises and we look at all the sequels because both him and I, we love sequels. And just this past summer, we did a, a series on the Halloween films. And it's like, well, when you watch Halloween, you know, you set up a movie a certain way, but then you get to a sequel because it's popular enough. And then you have to change certain elements and you kind of got to retcon things. So now we invent that Laurie Strode's his sister, right? And then you get to, you know, skip Halloween three, you get to Halloween four and, you know, he was supposed to be dead, but no, he's not really dead. So now this character has got even more superpowers, right? And, the, and while I love sequels and I really love watching all the entries in a series, the, things tend to get out of control when you start bringing these characters back so many times. Hmm. Mm -hmm. So I kind of, I kind of limit it to, I, I kind of uh, associate it with that as the sequel that keeps happening over and over. Patrick, what do you think about that? What do you think I about also... how Patrick, uh, sorry, what do you think of how Section 31 has been brought back and changed so much? So I think one of the reasons they use Section 31 instead of starting, just stating it's the, security arm of the Federation is because I think they believe the average fan sees it the way I did before having this conversation, that it was just, it was a secret part of the, of Starfleet. And also it's just a recognizable name. And like, like David Mack said, it's, you know, it has a cool name. People, people, they know it. They either love it or hate it, but they all understand what section 31 does. So it's, it's easy to get people to believe that they're, doing this in you know in easy terms but it is true that it's really hard to say that they were there in uniform as a secret organization which Brandon I think we brought that up once podcasting up on the edge that they shouldn't have been standing there in uniform right yeah we it's, yeah we did talk about that at the they, time they could have fixed it easily by just having someone on the ship or in contact with the ship that wasn't a uniformed officer, right? That would have fixed the whole problem. But they mm -hmm. wanted to show off the cool, like David said, the cool uniforms, the cool comm badges and, and, and whatnot. Well, the thing is, I even suggested this because I was giving notes uh, to the team on, section, on season one of Discovery. And I saw this in the scripts and I sent back a note that said, look, this doesn't track with anything we know about Section 31. But these guys don't have to be Section 31. These guys could be Starfleet Special Ops. 
you know, you could mm-hmm. you could create a whole new spinoff thing, Starfleet Spec Ops, and that have these guys with the black com badges be that. So there's no reason. No one has ever said the word Section 31 yet. There's no reason these guys have to be that. You could change them into Starfleet Spec Ops, have a whole bunch of new, you know, super military badasses within Starfleet, and it totally tracks and nobody needs to say it wasn't there before. It's just we never had a reason to show it. But they didn't take my advice, and eventually I lost that argument, and it was decided to reveal that the black combat just were Section 31. Mm-hmm. Yeah, interesting. Um, so let's talk a little bit about Enterprise and the portrayal of Section 31 in, Enter- in Enterprise. So we got Section 31 in four episodes. Uh, they were in Affliction and Divergence, which was the two-parter where uh, we found out that the Klingons had taken some samples of the augment DNA and were attempting to make augmented Klingons. And then they were in Demons and Terra Prime, which was basically the final two episodes where... Um, there's a, a resurgence of this anti-alien organization on Earth called Terra Prime, and and they're tr- they want to they want to eliminate aliens from Earth's solar system so it can be one for humans. So we've got a member of the crew who, at some time previously, had been recruited into Section Thirty One, but he thought he was finished with them, and this is Reed. Right, so we don't really know exactly what happened to him, but I believe if I remember the episode correctly, I just watched it today. He was like an ensign uh, on another ship or at, at a different point in Starfleet when he was recruited by Section Thirty One. Uh, do you guys think that Reed was the right choice to to use as a character that had previously been associated with Section Thirty One? I think Reed was the right uh, character. I think his temperament fits with someone that I think Section Thirty One would recruit from within other ranks of Starfleet, mm-hmm. and I believe. The fact, the story they gave was that he was, like you said, he was an ensign, right? Which makes sense because they'd want to pick people up early and help them move through the system to get to better positions. Mm -hmm. And finding someone at a high level would be much harder to bring over than it would to help someone at a lower level. And then, you know, when they get where they're going, to tap them again for information. It was interesting to have Reed as the choice because, you know, he's a character that we don't really know much about. So for him to, to it's, he's almost like an open slate of a character that we could have, you know, that we can write this on. So it, it's just interesting that he, with him with such a security background, he would be willing to work with an organization that was doing things in an illegal manner. So it's, I, I often wonder if that was a contradictory uh, thing for him to be doing. Mm. What do you think about that, Patrick? So, yeah, I do think it's somewhat contradictory, but I also think that there are, in order to be part of Section 31, you have to be willing to do those things. Mm-hmm. You know, so while to the average person, you or me, it would seem, why would someone with a security background do that? But isn't that the perfect people to have in your organization? People no one would expect to do the job? Mm-hmm. See, in Deep Space Nine, they went after Bashir because he was genetically enhanced, right? And they figured he'd be like a smart operative and a good person to have, but he didn't have any security background. The only thing that he had was his spy adventures on the holodeck. Yeah, I think, however, that they might have been interested in genetically enhanced persons because past experience may have led them to believe that these people uh, not only possess superior abilities, but that very often those superior abilities led to uh, the, the foundation of attitudes and viewpoints that were more in line with Section 31's point of view, uh, with its ethos. And I think that what surprised them was that Bashir was an outlier. He was an unexpected event in that not only did he have these enhanced abilities, but he also had an extremely enhanced moral center that was perhaps unusual for people with his sort of enhancement. Mm -hmm. And I think that's what caught them looking with Bashir. I, I, you know, I love Section Thirty One, and like I've often, you know, I've often watched them and been like, man, I think that'd be kind of a cool organization to work for. Maybe I'm a bad person at heart. I don't know. Maybe I just like the spy aspect of it, and I haven't thought too much about the the illegal nature in which they're uh, in which they're working. But uh, I've always really loved Section Thirty One. I think it's a great addition to the Star Trek universe, and I'm really glad that D Space Nine did introduce it because it gives you a lot to think about because you know that was one of the great things about D Space Nine is that it was like there were so many questions of morality they would pose these questions to you and there would necessarily wouldn't be a right answer for it mm-hmm. you know like like where is the line to be drawn you know like it's not section 31 related but i go back to you know paradise and home uh, paradise loss and home front i believe is the two parter mm-hmm. you know and it's like you you 
I could see the point where they're like, we need to take Grandpa Cisco's blood, but I could see Grandpa Cisco where he's like, I shouldn't have to be put under this, un, under this scrutiny. And it's like, well, where's that line draw? Like, I can see both points of view, you know. And while I don't necessarily think that Section Thirty One was involved there, that's what I do like about Deep Space Nine for the questions that they would bring, and they wouldn't necessarily have right answers. And they did it so many times on the show. You know, and I think that's what what brought Section Thirty One, and I think it did bring something interesting to the Star Trek universe. And you know, while I don't like the badges on Discovery, I am very interested to see what they might bring to Discovery and what kind of aspect it's going to play, and how is it going to interplay into Season Two, and you know, for what we might see out of them out of the future. Yeah, so I think the the primary value that it brings from a storytelling perspective, at least where I think it began is that it does allow us a new angle from which to interrogate the values of the Federation Mm -hmm. to question, well, what is it we really stand for? And are we willing to stand up on a matter of principle against an organization like this that purports to be our ally? Are we willing to give up an asset, an advantage such as this, in the name of moral principle? Or is this a case where we're going to bend our moral principles because we're the beneficiaries? And that's really one of those questions where, as you see, different characters are willing to turn a blind eye, are willing to sort of bend for the sake of survival, where they will you know, say, well, it serves the greater good. Uh, but then you have others who say, yes, but you know, you can't turn an eye to the evils they've performed. It's interesting seeing which characters, for instance, within the Star Trek universe are going to stick to their moral guns and go up against Section 31, uh, consequences be damned, and which are going to say, we have to find a middle path here, uh, and maybe we should think twice before we cut off this appendage, illegal or otherwise, that is protecting the body politic. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see, now that leads to my last question then, and I don't know if this is a naive question, but I understand that they're working in an illegal way, but is Section 31 justified? Are we justified in having an arm of the government that's, you know, not officially sanctioned, that's doing these things, and they're doing the, the hard stuff that they need to be extra legal in order to take care of? Or do we look and say, no, the right way is the right way, and we should be doing it the right way? Because I look at an episode of Voyager, like Void, I believe it's called Void, um, which is the one where they they fall into that that void space and they find all these ships trapped there and there's a whole bunch of trips that uh, a whole bunch of ships that are stealing from each other but voyager says no we're going to work together and we're going to establish our little federation here and their idea of working together and working for good help them to escape and leave so is the right way always the right way or are we justified in having something that could take an illegal approach well i mean it's interesting you bring that up the one of the facts of intelligence work is that there are officially recognized assets of an intelligence organization who operate under what's known as official cover. And these are the agents we send into foreign countries and technically on paper, they are not CIA intelligence officers on paper. They are employees of the state department working in diplomatic outreach. They're, employees of the Department of Agriculture specializing in the import of citrus fruits and so on and so forth. These are known as official cover operatives. But we also have what are called non-official cover operatives, NOC agents. And non-official cover operatives do not have government jobs. They don't have diplomatic immunity. They don't work out of the embassy. They tend to go over under false pretenses, usually with civilian employment sometimes under assumed names, and they are considered deniable assets. If they're, they're like impossible mission force agents. If they are caught or killed, the secretary disavows any knowledge of their actions. If they go to prison, too bad. They get killed, too bad. We don't barter for them. We don't negotiate for their return if they get caught. We don't try to extricate them if they get caught. Uh, so we have these agents. But again, these agents operate for an agency that is answerable and does have oversight. And if there's a massive enough screw up with a non-official cover agent and it blows up, the blowback hits an organization that can be called before Congress and made to answer for its screw up and people can get fired and careers can be ended and people can be sent to jail if necessary, if the screw up is big enough in order to save political face. 
the reason I think Section 31 is so dangerous in this respect is that because, according to statements made in DS9, the organization does not officially exist, regardless of this you know, thing about how it was you know, created, you know, they found an excuse in the Starfleet Charter or whatever. Regardless of that, if it doesn't officially exist and nobody is legally accountable, if they screw up really badly, who's accountable? Now you've got an international incident and no way to put on a, let's say, even a dog and pony show to pacify your enemies. Now you're stuck because now you've got no way to prove who these guys did or didn't answer to, what did or didn't go wrong. Nobody can be held accountable. Um, what you've got now is a criminal organization. And in a way, in, in some respects, it is the ultimate deniable asset. But on the other hand, it also means that if they screw up big enough, you've got an international incident and no diplomatic means of recourse to fix it. So that that's the danger with something like that. Excellent. Right on. Patrick, do you have any final thoughts on Section 31 as a whole? For one, I'd love that story where one of them does screw up bad enough and we have to go through all that um, because I think that could actually tie the two points both of you just made together about proving the issue with the accountability but also letting us see what the characters really think because at that point the ones who are willing to still fight for that but let's say the person gets captured they're the ones saying that it doesn't matter that they didn't exist we you know they're still one of us and the other people would just be like well i didn't want them to exist in the first place type deal um i think that would be a really cool story but anyway well it's, it's funny you should say that because that actually forms the basis of my interlinked series of star trek novels that i've been writing for the last 15 years going all the way back to A Time to Kill and A Time to Heal, which were published around uh, October, uh, November, uh, actually September, October of 2003 or 2004. Um, and what happened there is that essentially Section 31, we find out, was involved in the political coup in the Federation, and they removed a sitting Federation president from office by illegal means. And that there were elements of Starfleet who were involved in this without realizing that they were aiding Section 31. Uh, and all of that, along with many other things that Section 31 has done, uh, got publicly exposed, uh, at least in the novel verse, in my novel Section 31 Control, which was sort of the long time culmination uh, of the Section 31 story arc that I've been working on for years, where Bashir basically sacrifices everything in the end to take down section 31. It costs him absolutely everything. Uh, the woman he loves, it cost him his career, his commission, uh, and pretty much his sanity. He winds up a broken man. He's lost everything by the end of it, but he takes them down and sends them down in flames and brings them out into the light. And they pretty much anybody left in section 31 who's still alive by that point is going to jail. <laughs> I mean, he, he takes them down hard. Uh, pays a big price. But so if you're interested in seeing a story like that where this critical error, this moment of overstep sets in motion, you know, the, the dominoes that over a period of years, you know, can destroy an organization and lead to an interstellar scandal. Well, we've got, we've done it. We've actually, mm -hmm. we've written it. Yeah. Awesome. So yeah, I'm books. definitely going to check those out because I definitely have not read enough Star Trek books as it is. So I, now I can definitely add that to my list because that, mm -hmm. that, that's exactly the story I'm looking for after this conversation. Yeah. Um, and for the listeners, if they have read those books, um, the, the A Time To series, like David Mack is a frequent guest on Literary Treks, which is our, our Star Trek novels podcast. And he was most recently on for episode 250 of Literary Treks, and he did an interview on uh, the... You, you, it was technically you're on for the last book uh, of the... or your last book of the Time To series, but you were kind of talking about both of them there. Mm -hmm. uh, a Time To Hate and A Time To... And time to heal? No, Time To Heal... And a time to a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to kill, and time to heal. Yeah, they were books seven and eight of the a time to mini series, which ran for nine books, and was published in uh, two thousand four. And what this nine book series was was kind of laying the seeds from getting from insurrection to nemesis. Yeah. So all these books are pre nemesis novels. Yeah, they they uh, they, 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 they chronicle the year leading up to the events of nemesis. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Right on, David. Did you have any final thoughts on section thirty one? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think we've uh, pretty much covered like my big thoughts about the organization. Uh, just that I 
have to say, I mean, you're right. They are a fun organization. They're a fun narrative element to work with. If they weren't, I wouldn't have gotten so much mileage out of them in the books, Mm -hmm. but it's the fact that they are so ruthless and devious and secretive that makes them fun to use. But the thing to remember is they're not supposed to be the heroes. The thing you got to remember about section 31 is they're supposed to be the bad guys. They're not supposed to be the heroes. Mm -hmm. And I think, current uh i think star trek fandom has gotten so obsessed with what's cool that they have equated cool with good and they've forgotten that sometimes the bad guys are cool but that doesn't mean they're not bad guys well it's like when you watch sons of anarchy you know like there's so many times when i'm wa- when i was watching sons of anarchy for the first time because i kind of binged it where i'm like yeah these guys are awesome and then they like burned the tattoo off of somebody's back and i'm like these people are horrible oh my goodness what am i gonna do with my life these people are terrible i love that show i watched the whole thing but i remember (laughs) i had nightmares after the uh episode that did away with maggie sif's character oh man i mean what a what a terrible way to die and so brutal i mean the the show is just evil and by the time you get to the end of it you realize none of these are good people there's no good people here this is a bunch of very bad people so yeah, I loved Sons of Anarchy too, and there was quite a few deaths that were horrific. Oh God, yeah. Um, but yeah. I think that's part of the point too. I think both sides, the people who love and who hate Section Thirty One, many of them don't really get that they're supposed to be the bad guy, and that causes their either love or hate of them. If that mm-hmm. makes sense, because I think some of the people who hate them are like, "Well, this is the Federation, and look at what they're doing." But you're supposed to have that reaction. That's a good thing. That's right. Mm-hmm. That's right. That's not. You're not reacting wrongly. You're not. You're. Su- I like them because they make me do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. They're, they're supposed to make us question. You know, how did it get to the point where these people ha- have this level of power, have this level of asset? How have they not been brought to justice yet? And will this thing that we believe in or want to believe in, the Federation, will it have the courage? to bring them to justice, even though doing so is not going to be to its benefit in the long run. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Right on. Well, David, why don't you tell us, you've got a couple of books coming out right now. You got a sequel to your popular uh, novel, Midnight Front. Tell us where people can find you and what's what to look out for, uh, for your works. The next thing I have coming out, and I'm not sure if that will be before or after this podcast uh, reaches the fans on January 15, 2019, we'll see the release of my novel, the iron codex. That's Mm -hmm. book two of my dark art series, which began with the midnight front released last year. Uh, Both books will be available uh, wherever fine books are sold, both in retail and online. And if you want to find me online and keep track of what I have going on and what I'm working on, what I have coming out, you can find my official website at davidmack.pro. That's David Mack, M A C K dot P R O. And you can follow me on Twitter at David Allen Mack, David Allen, Alan, A-L-A-N-M-A-C-K, and that's on Twitter. Well, talking about Section 31 is not all we've been discussing here on the network this week, so take a listen to this little clip and see what else you may have missed elsewhere on Trek FM. Previously on Trek.FM. To the journey! <laughs> Brace for a minute, yes. <laughs> okay, if... Uh... I, I, I'm going to make a commitment to myself right now. If I am ever perishing in a plane crash, I am going to say brace for impact right before I die to everyone on the plane. I will brace somehow for impact. hear it across the miles. It'll be very dramatic, you know, with some dramatic theme music playing, hopefully, <laughs> just like we have in Voyager here this episode. Earl Grey. That's terrible. Wow. Like, why would someone think that? I mean, if it's going to infect <laughs> this entire world of Ferengi, You've got to assume that there's going to be visitors or whatever, and then it's just going to spread yeah, everywhere. Spread that everywhere. doesn't even make sense. Doesn't doesn't sound like a good plan. No, to me. it does not. Literary treks. Both Bound and myself like Star Trek stories that work as uh, some kind of a parable that uh, hold up the mirror to modern times. And when we got the assignment that we could actually write the Prometheus trilogy, we were pretty sure that we wanted to do something contemporary with it, that we wanted to put modern day into a science fiction story. And the biggest problem that we saw at the time was terrorism. Melodic treks. You know, I suppose as being an actor, you know, I just was really kind of feeling into Clive's character. 
okay. and and trying to express the emotion of what I felt like he was going through on the sarangi. Mm-hmm. So then it became much more of a personal, individual character. It was how I experienced doing it. And that's what else is happening on Trek.fm. Check out all these shows and join the conversation about your favorite corner of the Star Trek universe and beyond. You'll find us wherever you get your podcasts. If you're an Apple user, be sure to hit the subscribe button in Apple Podcast on iPhone, iPad, or Apple TV, or the desktop iTunes app to get the latest episodes as soon as they are published. And please leave us a star rating and written review. If you're not an Apple user, we've got you covered as well. You can find our shows on Google Play Music, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spreaker, SoundCloud, Windows Phone, in most third-party apps, and you can stream and download the MP3 file from our website or grab the RSS link. We'd love to hear your thoughts on today's show, and if you disagree with any of our opinions, we'll kill you. There are many ways for you to do that. We could burn you. We could throw you out an airlock. Uh, So maybe you probably just don't tell us what you think of the show. The best place to join in a large conversation is the Babel Conference, our listeners group on Facebook. Just type B-A-B-E-L into the search field on Facebook and it should come right up. And again, if we need your help killing any, you know, like Romulans or anything like that, or any Vulcans that we don't really like, we might get you to help us out with that. If you'd like to send us an email, you can use the form on our website at trek.fm slash contact. And even if you choose to delete that email, we've probably already read it. Choose to send to a show and select Warp 5. That will come right to us. You can also find the network on Twitter at TrekFM and on Facebook at Facebook.com slash TrekFM. But you know what? Don't even try and find us because we've already found you. So, Patrick, where can people find you when you're not doing a whole bunch of illegal stuff and, uh, you know, disavowing yourself? Well, when I'm not doing that uh, and I want to be found because that's the key here, you can find me on the Babel Conference, which I've been very busy doing my other stuff, so I haven't been there much. You can find me on Twitter at Magic Drop 5. It's one word. The five is a number, not letters. And you can find me coming to you every other week, which we'll be ramping up to every week soon, with uh, with the brightest star of Trek FM, Amy Nelson, on the edge. So, Brandon, where can people find you when you're not sneaking around in, in back alleys trying to find ensigns to turn over to your side? <laughs> You can find me on Twitter at Brandon Metella. You can find me here once a month on the network with Melodic Treks, which is all about the music of Star Trek. You can find me once a month on the Fandom Podcast Network with my friends Chris and Tom, where we talk about Alfred Hitchcock films in chronological order. And our next episode that'll be coming out is Secret Agent, and we got a special guest for that, so make sure you tune in. Uh, you can find me intermittently on the Cinematic Sound Radio Network with my electronic film score show called Breaking the Waves. Uh, but the big news is, as I mentioned in the episode, franchise fatigue over on the United Federation of Podcast Network with my friend Zach Moore, and we cover film franchises. And right now we are early in our run. We've only had three episodes released as of this recording, and we're covering the mission impossible series of films so we've done mission impossible one and two and uh actually as soon as i'm done talking to you tonight we're recording our episode on mission impossible three which was uh done by jj abrams so and it's a really darn good movie (laughs) cool i i'm not a mission impossible guy how far did you Uh, get in the series one you should skip two and watch three trust me try okay because like i watched one on video and i liked it I watched two and was like, this is terrible. And I never went back. And every time I saw a trailer, I rolled my eyes. And then when Fallout came out this year, I kept seeing the trailer. And I'm like, man, this looks good. I want to see this. I want to see this. So I bought the five-disc Blu-ray set for the first five films. I watched the first one. I'm like, this is not bad. I watched the second one. I'm like, this is just terrible. Right? And then I'm like, I don't even want to go. But jump in in three. And literally, honestly, you don't even need to know what's gone on in one and two. You could just start with three. That is not even a joke. And it's really good, and 3, 4, and 5, and 6 are amazing. I'll have to check it out then Yeah, uh, and catch up. I'll have to go buy that Blu-ray set now myself. Mm-hmm. So, But if you'd like to help us keep all of our shows coming to you each week in a very secretive manner, you can become a patron on the network on Patreon, where we don't list any lists. Visit patreon.com slash trekfm. That's p-a-t-r-e-o-n dot com slash trekfm. That's just the code words. To get all the details, perks include early access to episodes, exclusive content, producer credits, and more. Available through our special patrons website, Patron Zone. It requires a great deal of money to produce, host, and distribute these coups each month. 
and we really appreciate any support you can give us and hope you'll join the team. Again, you'll find all the details at patreon.com slash trekfm. And at this time, we'd like to thank our wonderful associate producers here on Warp 5. We've got some deep, dark secret agents. we got Norman C. Lau, Floyd Dorsey, Mike Morrison, Tim Cooper, Justin Ozer, Mark Flessa, Chris Tribuzio, and Jim McMahon. Thank you guys so very much for supporting uh, Warp 5 and Trek FM as a whole. We really appreciate it, and we couldn't do it without you. So I'm happy to be back. I had a lot of fun talking at Enterprise tonight, some Section 31. I'll be back as soon as I can, guys. Um, but uh, it's it's kind of nice to be able to talk about something different than Star Trek. Uh, but, I, you know, I do miss Brandy and Patrick, so uh, maybe we'll have them over on Franchise Fatigue. We can talk about some kind of franchise movies. Uh, but I guess until next time, keep calm and boom on. Okay, let's open up and do our exits here. Um, yeah. All right, I'm ready, so I'll do checkout, you do contact, I'll do patrons, and you do the Okay, games. so you start? Yeah. Okay, so if we can do a clap here so I just know where to go, just do a bunch of claps here. La!